Welcome, everyone. This is Tim Selden from the Monastery Foundation, and with me is my partner in not crime, but good work. <laughs> good, good to be here. Thanks, Tim. Hey, Clint Lash here with uh, with Ames, which I feel like I always need to keep reiterating. This stands for Admissions Inquiry and Marketing Software, so that is where the acronym comes from. And this is our our ongoing uh, webcast on Tuesdays called Find the Perfect Match. It's based on a course that we teach at the Monastery Foundation called Finding the Perfect Match. And it's the whole idea of recruiting and retaining not just warm bodies, but families who will love you for what you are, who will ask what can they do to help instead of what have you done for me lately? Uh, and just building that whole sense of partnership. Uh, and over the course of the years ahead, we, along with various guests that we invite, will will not just be here to either sell the Monastery Foundation, which is not just something that works with Montessori schools, but with all kinds of private, non-public charter schools around the country and overseas. Um, although we are specialists in Montessori education, but we love every non-public school. Uh, and with Ames, uh, a software service that has a lot of things, and I, I will, I'm not part of Clint's team. I will, I'm one of the people who use his service. I actually came to know him fairly recently from a mutual friend. And I will, I have been in this field for almost 50 years. I've worked with a group that Clint used to work with um, independent school management uh, for many years as a, one of their clients. And I really appreciate them and what they have to offer. We really appreciate the people who have spun off from them, including ourselves as a monastery specific school consulting group and Ames, which is a, a sort of an agency that's got in my opinion, really great service at a really good price. And so I was really glad to get to know Clint and impressed enough that I reached out and said, Clint, how would you like to start doing a, another one of our ongoing weekly webinars for school leaders? These webcast recordings and the transcripts are sent out to you shortly after they're finished, once we have the transcript ready and the summary ready and the recording ready. They're also mounted on the Monastery Foundation's YouTube channel. And hopefully over the course of time, we'll deal with enough practical issues that either we come up with or you come up with that you think we should uh, address. And we'll do it in a way that's really not a webinar. We don't want to talk at you. We want to talk with you. So again, we invite you, open up your camera, open up your mic. Let's talk with each other about the real issues we all face, in this case, specializing on the focus of recruiting, retaining, building community, doing all the things that are involved with admissions in our schools. So Clint, today we're going to talk about writing the perfect ads. That's right. I, and I feel like right now, given where we're at, you know, folks got a lot of, you know, whether it's open house events coming up, but it, folks are really kicking in their their advertising into into high gear um and as you know, what the nice part is of having the software platform we see i see hundreds and hundreds of ads kind of going through the system so we have we have a, an ads platform built into our system that makes ad, running ads really easy there's some ai in there that helps optimize them but the nice part is you know we, we can see a lot of the ads we can see what's working what's not working and um you know i think it's good to talk today about Okay, what is a really good framework for writing ads that frankly get results, that get people to stop scrolling on Facebook, read your ad, click, register for that event, or at least get them to do what you want them to do? And, and like I said, I'd probably advertising might be one of the hottest topics right now that people are emailing me about, getting on phone calls about. Um, even during the la our last webcast last week, I said, hey, you know, what should we talk about the next in the coming weeks? And I said advertising, so here we are. Now, the creative part of the ads is, you know, there's a lot that can go in the ads, but the creative part is, and I think nowadays um, is probably the most important part of your advertising. It, it is the creative. The nice part about where we're at now with these digital ad platforms, we can use AI, you can do a lot of the heavy lifting for moving your budget around. That's what our platform does to, to make sure, you know, only the perfect ads are running. 
So there's more of an emphasis than ever that your ad copy, your ad creative um, needs to be really on point. And I think I'll just jump in and say, one of the thing, I don't know if I want to say challenges, mistakes, I'm not sure what the right word is. One of the things that I've seen when I look across all these ads um, in terms of let's talk about the ads that may not be performing up to benchmark are they sound like everybody else, right? They're, there's very similar language. And I made a joke about this. If anybody saw the email I sent out this morning where it was like experience the put your school name in there difference experience the Ames Academy difference, right? I think everybody is using that phrase to some degree. And so I would say if everybody's using it, it's probably time let's, let's figure out another way to use that. So again, we'll talk, uh, you know, Tim's a master when it comes at, comes to with messaging and, you know, writing ads that get people to stop and click and take an action. So yeah, I think this will be a really fun session to talk through writing ads we'll give you some frameworks we'll give you some guides that you know when in doubt these these are some proven frameworks that work really well uh, for running ads and I, I probably jumped ahead of what, in terms of what we're talking about but yeah so today again we don't want this to just be a presentation we want this to be interactive but you know here's a guide for today let's talk about messaging right so the whole point of this podcast or webcast i should say is to find your ideal families well a part of finding your ideal families is creating the messaging that resonates perfectly with your ideal families, right? Regina's ideal family might be different than Kitty's ideal family, right? So we don't want the same ads running for the same for different schools saying, "Hey, come to our open house." You know, we got small class sizes, and you're going to experience the our school difference. And right, so we need to speak to who is your ideal family. If you had to sit and write down. Who, if, if you could pick out, you know, from your community, these are the three types of families that seem to excel. These students seem to excel here. You know, who are they? And then developing messaging for them. We'll give you some frameworks. Um, certainly, if we have time, we can go through some real examples. Um, I'll even share a link to uh, some Canva templates. If anybody likes to use Canva, I love Canva. Um, decent ad templates that, that work. we call the creative, the image or video itself. That's the other area where I tend to see some, again, mistakes, if that's the right word, where I, I feel like schools kind of treat digital advertising like they treat billboard advertising, meaning when you do a billboard, you've got one shot, one piece of creative, one message, you put it out there, you hope it works. And I see a lot of Facebook accounts where that's the case. Maybe there's one image, maybe there's two. You, you put it out there and it works. Is anybody, else, is anybody guilty of that? Putting out one or maybe one or two. You know, the, the beauty of the digital platforms these days, especially Facebook and Instagram, is that, you know, you can run 20, 30 variations of ads to find out very quickly what's the messaging that's working? What's the image that's working? And so we'll talk about different images to test. Again, some other things I see going on, images where there's just the image of the kids in the classroom or the three kids under the tree. Everybody's got the same images. We can all have the smiling kid in the, in the on the image, right? Uh, it's not that we don't want that, but what can we put that, what kind of template can we put that into that that draws some attention? So we'll give us some tips in terms of, again, what, what we see, what I see working from looking across hundreds of ads, um, give you some guidance say, hey, here's a really good starting point for for your advertising. Tim, anything to, to add there before we dive in? Well, I just think it's always important to ask the questions that you're asking, Clint, which is first off, who are the people you're trying to attract? Um, and what kind of messages make them stop and listen? Because people are being overwhelmed with information. It's just coming at them from every direction and you become tone deaf to it. Secondly, you've got to think about what's the purpose of the ad. It's not to say we exist, that's easy. It's we exist, this is how you can contact us, but something dramatic. So for example, one of the things that Clint and I tried for one of the schools I'm associated with was 
an ad that says proudly no football team since 1984 which and i will i will say that had close to 10 times higher click-through rates than any ad i've ever seen (laughs) but go ahead tim no, no, he's, the bottom line is you're looking for things that are outrageous. You don't want to turn people off. But on the other hand, what you're trying to do is use an ad to accomplish two things. One, get the right people to call. But the other thing that you want is for the wrong people to not bother you. And it's it's not that they know who they are or that you know who you are or you're not going to be gracious to everybody, but you are trying to use your advertising to get people to stop, look, listen, think, pay attention. And one of the things you want to try to do is get the right people to come to your door and people that are looking for something very different to to have the feeling that you're a reliable source of expertise. And if you're not the right school for them, you'll help them find the right school for their child. And that, by the way, could be a kind of a message in itself, like Miracle on 34th Street. If we don't have what you want, we'll send you from Macy's, we'll send you to Gimbel's. But Mm -hmm. figuring out the right way to get people's attention using whatever media that you've got, whatever budget you've got, whatever images you've got, and asking yourself, do you really want a drone shot of your campus? Is that what's going to get them to come? Maybe it is. Um, Data testing. In other words, trying different things and seeing what works better definitely helps. But data testing isn't just how many people click on your ad or how many phone calls you get. It's how many actual new kids enroll. That's the count that you're looking for. Are we getting the right families who actually love us enough that they carry all the way through and become lifers? That's what we're trying to do with ads. It's the first step in the the dance. And can I just say real quick, you mentioned about the drone shot or the drone footage of campus. There was one school that I was was helping with their ads and it was really interesting. They had an incredibly beautiful campus, big brick building, like just gorgeous. But you couldn't actually see the campus really from the road. So what was really interesting was when we were running their ads, um, you know, they had kids in the classroom, you know, all the, the great pictures of, of kids on, on campus doing different things, sports pictures, uh, theater pictures. The ad that performed the best was the pictures of their buildings. Because I feel like, you know, and the guess was that was like nobody's probably really ever seen it unless they've come on campus. But the point of that is we would have had no idea, right? I, I think one of the other things to kind of keep in the back of your mind, whether we're going through ad messaging or the, or the images or videos themselves, Do not make any assumptions about what you think might be a good ad or not. I can't tell you how many times I've run ads and I think, oh, this is this is a really good ad we put together. This is a really great image. Next thing you know, it's the lowest performing one and one you thought like, ah, we'll we'll just test that. And it's the best performing one. You, You just you don't know, but you let the data tell you and the data will tell you very quickly about what's working, what isn't. So the best thing you kind of do is, as the old saying goes, kind of throw some stuff up against the wall and you see really what, what works best. And um, and it's not to say you don't, you, you, you want each one of those ads to be the best that they could be, but don't say, oh, we got to use this picture, but not that one. If you like both, go with both, three, four, five different ones, right? So um, just wanted to, to kind of mention that before. And I, I want to, I'm going to ask a question here shortly about who is your ideal audience? I would just whether you just unmute or type it in the chat, but starting to think about who who are your ideal families and what are they looking for, right? So I'll put that out there. Start thinking about that. I want to start with this quote here from a legendary marketer, legendary copywriter Eugene Schwartz, where he says. Copy cannot create desire for a product. It can only take the hopes, dreams, fears, and desires that already exist in the hearts of millions of people and focus those already existing desires onto a particular product. Point of that is, right now, there are families out there in your community that are looking for something, right? Maybe they're looking to get away from something. Maybe it's they're not having a great experience at a, at a current school, or they're looking for something. They have a desire for 
the best college prep environment possible. They have a desire, you know, maybe they're entrepreneurs and they're looking for another, uh, for a school that can help their child, you know, kind of develop that entrepreneurship of a spirit, right? Whatever it might be, right? There are families out there that when I, we say here, I want to highlight this, they have fears, frustrations, goals, and aspirations. And, and you might think, well, fears is a weird word, but making sure that they find the right school, especially if maybe they're at a school where, hey, this wasn't the right fit. They don't want to jump around different schools. They want to find that perfect fit. Why are you better? Like, are, are you all the same? Are they going to have the same experience? Why are you different? Same thing with frustration, but then also goals, right? W what are they, they looking for? Um, and the one example I use a lot with this, and then I'll turn it over to everybody, is thinking about my daughter's school, right? It was a K to eight, that school that goes up to K to eight versus the uh, the K to 12. And when talking with their admissions director, they were like, yeah, the number one question that we get as families are trying to figure out the best solution, because outside the Philadelphia area, um, tremendous amount of private schools, a lot of competition, some really great public schools in the area. So families were always asking like, hey, should we, why should we choose the school that goes up to eighth grade versus the school that goes to 12th grade, right? Um, so that's that's a, maybe a fear of make, not making the right decision that you need to address head on saying, hey, you know, here are the advantages to choosing a K-8 versus a K-12 when they actually put together some copy around that. So before we start diving deeper, um, I, see, I see some messages came in already. So uh, Healy had said, Committed to Montessori education through the entire program, lives the culture at home, involved in their community, looking for a school that fosters a love of learning, prepares child for the outside world. Um, I think that's an interesting, a good angle, prepares child for the for the outside world. So like Montessori, Montessori in itself is like, hey, are you looking for a Montessori school? And there's probably families that, you know, thinking about Montessori, there's probably families that fall into two camps, right? It is... Um, Families that know that they want Montessori, maybe they're trying to find the best Montessori option. And then there's families that are looking at multiple educational approaches. You know, maybe we'll call your, your standard private school, if you want to say it, that, say it that way. Maybe there's a Waldorf school in your area and the Montessori school, right? So how, how do you make the decision? Why Montessori versus the other educational approaches? Tim, I've always liked that that phrase that you said, the terrible twos or the terrific twos. I think that's a really catchy headline you know, that plays on that cliche of, oh, twos are terrible, but terrific twos. What, what, what are we talking about there? Do you want to talk about that at all, Tim? I'm, I know you've used that in ads before. Well, I mean, you know, many of us have programs for very young kids. And one of the classics is the perception that parents have that two-year-olds throw tantrums. And the reality is, as you know, two-year-olds don't need to throw tantrums. They will throw tantrums if they're frustrated. But if you do things right, whether you're Montessori or, or doing something totally different, you're going to get kids that are very calm, very self-assured, aren't crying, very much little young men and women who are amazing. In fact, one of my books is called How to Raise an Amazing Child. And I never imagined I, it would have that title. I think it's a stupid title, but that's the title <laughs> that sold. Um, so figuring out what gets someone's attention is really interesting. Uh, and others, because some of you are Montessori educators, I my mom founded the Barry School in 1932. I ran, ran it for 25 years. I then ran the Newgate School. They don't have the name Montessori in them. And yet, if you know those schools, they're very deeply ingrained in Montessori. So the question is, how do you get someone's attention? And how do you marshal all the different prejudices and fears and hopes? Why would anyone spend money when the public schools are free? Or some, you know, little and loud child care center can provide much cheaper early childhood education if your school includes programs at that level. Why are they coming to us? Why are they coming to your unique school? I'd love to hear from you all. What what kind of messages work? Yeah, is anybody running ads with a very specific angle? Whether maybe in a way I like to think about it is calling out the audience. 
Phil, I know that you're involved with a faith-based school. What what do you find has worked well for you in the Philadelphia market? Well, we're a very specific school for a very specific audience. So all of our families are Christian families. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of my advertising focuses around a Christian school for Christian families. Um, and we've been doing it for 80 years. Um, we definitely go with the, you know, one one building, one school, one drop off, you know, reduce the stress of changing schools every couple of years, even in a school district. You know, when you have a child in high school, middle school and elementary school and you can drop off once. Um, it makes it a, a pretty palatable option for some of our families, but particularly for Christian families in our area. Mm -hmm. um, but we do, I mean, we tailor to families inside Philadelphia and the surrounding suburbs. And uh, it, it is, um, you know, we we have different audiences, to be honest. So some of my ads are high school specific. Some of my ads are elementary, middle school specific, and even just pre-K specific. I think that's a really good point that you brought up there. It, it seems obvious, but I will tell you it is not obvious, is having the ads, you know, even just take, get it away from the, the messaging itself, but making sure you have ad groups focused on the grade levels, right? Because it can be tempting. Let's again, let's use the open house example because that's kind of that season. It could be very tempting to just run an open house ad. Hey, come to our open house. But what if you had messaging for your kindergarten about why the kindergarten family should come to the open house? And on the flip side, if you also have the high school, right? Why should high school families come to the open house? That messaging is going to be very different for obvious reasons. It should also be different in your in your ad. So I think that's that's a really that's that's a great point. That if you're not doing that, that that's only going to help you get better results from the ad. So more tailored, you can you can create that messaging. Real quick, Phil, I did have a question since you mentioned about the one kind of the one building, the one drop off, right? Um, was that something that you heard from you or anybody else on the team that you've heard from families like, oh, we just, you know, we love that it's like, how did you come up with that angle? It's like, I kind of like that, right? It's, it's just one of those things that potentially reduces stress or something to worry about. Just out of curiosity, I was wondering if there's anything specific that led to that particular angle. And is that angle working well? Yeah, I would say, you know, after giving tours for 13 years, I've, I've kind of <laughs> come to hear the same thing over and over again. And so when families say, oh, I want to pick a school where I know they can be uh, and I don't have to worry about, you know, where they're going to be in three years, if they're, you know, transitioning from middle school to high school, that they can still come to the same building. For some, that's it's actually a, a downside. They want the change. Um, but families that are coming to us, you know, they're sick of jumping from building to building and not knowing who their teachers are going to be and not knowing if it's going to be a different administration in that new building. Um, you know, in our area, we have a lot of elementary schools that feed into fewer middle schools that feed into even fewer high schools. And those high schools are giant. And yeah. uh, so particularly with our families, like I said, that have kids spread across, you know, three different sections of the school. Um, and they have also have a pre-K age kid and they can drop all of their kids off at the pre-K entrance. You know, they say to me, oh, I love being able to come and just drop my kids off in one spot <laughs> and then I can go about my day. That's, that's so interesting. And that, that hits right, kind of right what we're saying here, right? Like you had said, Hey, give me these tours for 13 years. And, and that, that's kind of part of the, um, creative process of writing your ads. It's like, what are the questions I'm answering every single day? Or what am I hearing every single day? Like that becomes the, the messaging. So that, that's great. And uh, as an aside here, Clint yeah. and, and Phil, you've, you've got a theme like that. I would either do a charrette periodically. In other words, gather a whole group of, of really interested stakeholders. It could be a special recruitment admission, parent ambassador, student advisory council you create or just a group of random people you pull into an office and say hey we're, we're looking for ad headlines you know how would give me a one-liner that that speaks to this the other thing you could do is go to chat gpt and say here's what our school's all about and this is what people seem to really like a lot of them um give me a hundred different headlines 
for a print or digital ad that speak to that and see if you find anything you really like. Yeah. Joanne gave us a challenge. And Joanne, your challenge, which is very interesting, which is how do you help parents who are coming to you in part because they're feeling worried? Um, they're worried about the safety of their children. I mean, it's feeling unsafe in the schools in a lot of communities. And how do you how do you communicate that if you come to our school, life is going to be easier. You, we're going to help you with the, your level of stress without causing them to focus on worry. Because the public schools are all trying to build fortresses and it's not working. And it's not working in part because there's always a way to sneak a weapon into a fortress. Look at what happened in Uvalde where the teachers kept propping the doors open uh, and somebody got in that way because they knew how the school worked. Or it's more typically the violence occurs from someone who's part of that school community. So how do you how do you come up with messaging that speaks to that fear, that need, that desire that, as you said, doesn't cause people to get even more afraid and maybe come to you with expectations you can't meet? Because the truth is a determined killer will get into any of our schools if that's what they want to do. And yet I would wager that all of us are running schools that are probably a whole lot safer than most. So how do you know how do you come up with your messaging? And that's really what today's all about. And, and so I suggest oh, chat GPT and circles of people just brainstorming like us sitting here right now. Um I'll I'll say two things about the message that Joanne had uh, or a comment and a question. One is I have an exact example to help you do this. There was a school where this was the exact same thing that we went through. Private school surrounded by public schools. And um, we were coming up with different angles for their ad campaigns. Before I say that in terms of how we did it, anybody have any suggestions for what, what you would do? Maybe you are doing this in terms of how are you communicating safety, community, how are you doing it in a way that's working really well? Anybody have any suggestions or examples? I always have an idea or two. It takes a village. We've got your back. Um, you're going to love it here. It's going to be safe. You know, we're, yeah. we're a partnership community. Um, no bullies allowed. Kindness, courtesy. Respect are the hallmark. Those are a few off the top of my head. Yeah. It's perfect. So we had a school, like I said, was running ads. Their first crack at running ads, so because they were surrounded by public schools, right? They thought, all right, our angle is going to be on our like outdoor classrooms, right? Really cool outdoor spaces, beautiful campus, ads showing kids like out in the in the forest, right? In creeks, in the water, like really cool environment. And their ads were doing okay, right? Ads were doing okay. And then right around benchmark. And then it was interesting, they did a parent survey. Uh, they got back their parent survey data and they said, well, well, this is interesting. A lot of the number one reasons why families are choosing our school is they mentioned terms like community and safety and things like that. So, okay, interesting. Let's create a whole campaign using that angle. So then that leads to Joanne's question about, okay, well, how do you communicate that angle? I'll give you a couple of different uh, ways to do that. One is exactly the way Tim said. You're not going to necessarily say, hey, we're safer, we're a safe community. You're not necessarily going to say that, but you're going to use words like, you know, every the teachers know, you're known in our community. You're using words like kindness and joy. Those are the exact words we, you know, kids find joy here. Everybody is kind. It's where kids are allowed to be kids, right? You're going to use phrases like that that all kind of insinuate the same thing. This is a great community, small community, safe community. You're going to say things like that, all right? So I'd say that's that's the first step is, and you can, be, again, like Tim had said, use ChatGPT to give you some different language to communicate that. But that's what we did uh, in all the Google ads, the Facebook ads. 
it was injected with those types of messages, joy, kindness, community, where everybody knows your name, right? Kind of playing off the cheers uh, uh, slogan there. And um, so that was one, the, uh, one way to do it. The other way to do it, which worked out really well with Facebook ads, was using parent quotes. Let the parents tell your story, right? So imagine you had a parent, like here's, here's your ideal scenario. You have a parent at the public school, the big public school, and they come to your, you know, maybe they're frustrated by whatever, too big, maybe they don't feel like it's safe. And again, not that they're gonna say, hey, I didn't feel safe over there. Um, but they left that school to come to your school and everything's been great, right? Imagine you have that scenario. You just have the quote saying, hey, you know, we, we were at this, we were at another school. Uh, my kid was frustrated. They were, in a, they were in a really big classroom. They feel like they were getting left behind. They just weren't happy anymore. We were looking for the best option. We came to this school. We were attracted by this. And you know what? My kid comes home every day loving it. They love their teachers. They're making great friends. There's a great community there. Like saying all those things, again, all, all insinuates community safety. Um, and so having your parents tell, have that messaging can be a really great scenario. So try to, if you don't have those already, trying to gather them would be a, a nice task. Any other thoughts, comments about, about that? I think it's a great example. Oh, and by the way, that, that angle of ads outperformed the outdoor classroom ads by three to one in terms of all the metrics that we were looking at. So it, it crushed, it was great. Thank you. That's a, that was really helpful. I appreciate that. Pleasure. And for all of you who are on, both Clint and I are effectively, even though we're from different nonprofits, or I'm from a nonprofit, I assume you're not nonprofit by design. Um, we can help you like an agency. A lot of times what happens is we either do it alone in-house, and it's very difficult to see your own school as well as an outsider can. Um, that's why people turn to marketing agencies. But marketing agencies usually don't know what it is to run your kind of school. So one of the much more affordable solutions sometimes is to ask, you know, can you help me either as part of the service I'm getting from you, like if you're one of Clint's clients like I am, or if you want a help from someone outside of Clint's firm, Montessori Foundation may be able to help you whether you're running a Montessori or a monastery school. We can help all kinds of schools think about their unique position in the market and figure out how do you get people's attention? That's what we love to do, whether it's billboards or Instagram or whatever. And I still think it's great to have a graphic designer and marketing people in house and social media and all all kinds of things that most of us either do or w wish we could do, but we're bottom line is we can help you if you want a hand. Absolutely. Let me um, let me keep going through here real quick, just to give some tips as you know. I, so as we're thinking about who are your ideal families, well, one is how do I identify them? How do we come up with the different angles? There's a lot of different ways. So I would say start with the way that Phil had mentioned is. You know, if you're doing tours, right, or, you know, even if you're not doing the tours, go talk to your admissions person and say, hey, what, what are the questions you're, an you're answering every single day, right? So you start there. Parent survey data is gold, right? And what I would say, again, and I mentioned this on a previous webcast, um, utilize ChatGPT. I did this with a, um, a French immersion school where they had hundreds of parents uh, survey responses, and we were trying to help come up with angles, parent uh, avatars who are our ideal families. And that can take you a lot of time to go through to try to figure out are there trends here. Load that up in the chat GPT, say, here's my parent survey data. I wanna find the top three reasons why families are choosing us. Um, identify the top three angles. Now from that, give me, um, help me with ad copy or help me build an avatar around those angles, right? So you can do that right in the chat GPT. And I would 100% do that. Just load the CSV file in there if you have survey data and just prompt it with what you want to prompt it with. And then, so I would say identify three or four angles. Now, the reason I said four angles is because inside of our ad platform, we have um, four different areas we can put copy into, and then it builds all different combinations for you. 
So for anybody that's using a names user, you I would say do four angles. Like don't just do one. I even see some folks making that mistake inside our platform. They're just they just put one angle in there, right? Have all all four. Allow yourself, allow the platform to do the mixing and matching for you, because otherwise you won't know is the outdoor outdoor classroom angle going to outperform the community and safety angle. You have no idea. So get that in there. And these are just pure examples, right? Some common ones, right? If you're really known for college prep, is that an angle? Is it the K to eight versus K to twelve conversation? Do you want are, are families looking for you know that kind of that entrepreneurship type of approach, right? Which oftentimes you get inside a Montessori type of school. Um, small classes again. Everybody has small classes. Uh, Tim, if it's okay with you, I I think one of your best performing ads with with, with your school I had to do around do with small class sizes. But I love the angle that you took to communicate that. So we'll go into an, we'll use that as an example. Um, and then and safety and community. So, you know, create an ad for each one of the, those angles. And then here's another really great way. Okay, how do we write? Um, how do we write the ad? Here's the other thing that I think there's this misconception about writing ads in Facebook and, and Instagram is that the ads have to be short. You know, we, we so much, we think that there's short attention spans. So we need like one or two liners and that's it. Um, Cause if you end up following this framework, what you'll notice is that the ad gets kind of long and there's a fear like, oh, we can't write a long ad. No, you can, as long as the ad is written well and it keeps you engaged. And uh, some of the best performing ads are on the longer side. And this is just a an aside. Um, I would do audits. I used to do a lot of audits for schools with their marketing um, marketing plan. And part of the audit was their social media. And we would use some software to analyze all of their social media posts. And what a really interesting piece of data that always came back is the social media posts that had the highest amount of engagement, so likes, shares, comments, had longer copy versus the shorter copy. That was across over 15 schools. It was the same across the board. So all of that to say, if you start writing ad copy and it starts to get long, don't have a fear of like, oh my God, it has to be shorter. What I would say is test short versus long. Let the data tell you what's going to work, but don't automatically dismiss long copy. So that's, that's my PSA for, for writing. Now, a way to rearrange those letters, PAS. Um, and Tim, I would love your thoughts in terms of messaging frameworks. I, I, I love all the, when you've shared with me all the ads that, that you've written and put together, I think they're fantastic. I, I would well, say, yeah, let, let, let me yeah. just jump in with a couple of quick thoughts. Yeah. These days, everyone believes that the parent of today has the attention of a gnat and that's really uh, insulting and is not true. The yeah. reality is that the way media is being delivered to them it's like on Instagram or Facebook Reels. It's fast, 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 fast. And it's true. There's a lot of people that that's the way they consume information. The real issue is how do you get their attention? Once you've got their attention, and this is something I learned from ISM many, many decades ago, Clint. There are three kinds of readers or three kinds of customers, if you will. The 30-second scanner, the three-minute person who will kind of look and circle some things and maybe do some underlying, underlining. And then there's the person who really takes whatever you said and tears it apart and asks, makes notes in the margin and wants to have a three hour conversation. All three of those people may be terrific prospective families for your school. So the ideal way of approaching it is to have a campaign, not just a single ad, but a campaign that integrates a lot of different tools from written material, your website, your ad, radio ads, whatever you're gonna do that addresses different kinds of people. And if you think of it, even this webinar that we're doing is kind of an ad from Clint's end for Ames, from my end for the Monastery Foundation, what we do for a living, which is help schools get started, help schools go through major transitions, help schools get better. Um, and we really like to think out of the box. So this is an hour long, deeper dive for people that like to get deeper dives to get a deeper sense of who is it you're talking to. 
designing anything you do so it gets their attention and having different kinds of approaches that get different kinds of people, you're most likely. And that's in addition to what I noticed that Phil mentioned, which is in a typical school, you've got different audiences. You've got people that have preschoolers and got middle schoolers. And you might have people that are approaching it because you're college prep or your sports program. All of those are legitimate pieces of your market. So you want to figure out where's the market coming from and invest energy in ways that keep trying to draw in more pieces of the market with people who really are going to love you. That's why we call it finding the perfect match. It's not just getting someone to apply. It's getting the right people to apply who are really going to appreciate what you've got. Awesome. Um what I have here on the screen is a really good framework for writing ad copy. I mean, it's great for any type of copy, website copy, ad copy, writing emails. It's it's a great copywriting framework. It's, it's a tried and true one uh, that's been around forever. Has anybody, feel free to unmute or type in a one if you have heard of this, type in a two if you haven't. Has anybody heard of the problem agitate solution framework? See a lot of no's. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so the problem agitate solution framework, it's um, it's just a really great way to structure your messaging in a psychological way to ultimately speak to those fears, frustrations, goals, and ambitions of, of anybody, even in this particular your, your family. So let me give you some examples about how this would work. And by the way, just knowing this, this is where you can also use ChatGPT to be to be that support for you. That if you know now who are your ideal families, what is the angle we're going for, you could tell ChatGPT, write me a Facebook ad using the problem agitate solution copywriting framework based upon this criteria, this angle, this type of messaging. And then it'll it'll build you some variations. And it does when you give it that type of guidance versus just saying, hey, write me an ad. But if you say write me an ad using this framework, it does a really good job. Mm -hmm. So problem agitate solution. So state the problem. Right. So this is where you want to call out your audience. So what's the angle? Are you looking for a, a school that will foster um, you know, helping your child become an entrepreneur? Right. So that, that's that's calling out that audience. Are you looking for a school where your child won't get lost in the crowd? Something like that. Right. So here this is going to we're going to use the small class sizes because it's something I see on pretty much everybody's website. We have small class sizes but taking a really unique approach to it, we're saying, does your child feel like just another number in an overcrowded classroom? That's pretty cool, right? That, that's good messaging because then if you get your somebody to stop on Facebook, they're either gonna shake their head yes or no. And your goal is to get as many people to say, yeah, that, uh, my, my child does feel that way. Um, and it's fine if they don't, but if they do, now you've really, you've hooked in that, that particular family, <laughs> excuse me, knowing that you're about to give them the solution. So does your child feel like just another number in an overcrowded classroom? Now we don't want to end there. We want to agitate that problem, dig a little bit deeper, get a little bit more emotional. So getting that emotional connection. So now here's the example. So how do we agitate that? In large schools, students often struggle to get attention and support they need. Teachers can't focus on every student, and many kids fall through the cracks, missing opportunities for individualized help and growth. Without that personalized attention, their strengths may go unnoticed, and they risk falling behind both academically and socially. That's kind of like taking they, they the knife in a little bit, right? That's that's that you know really agitating that problem. But that's that's the emotion, right? So if a family, if a parent is reading and they're like, "Yeah, this is what we're going through." then naturally they're going to believe that you have the solution because you've already empathized with a problem that they're experiencing. So then we want to present them solution, the solution. At our school name, we believe every child deserves to be seen and heard. With small class size and personalized approach, our teachers get to know each student, providing the support and guidance they need to excel. Your child won't just be another face in the crowd. They'll receive the individual, individual attention they need to thrive, build confidence, and unlock their full potential. It's a pretty good ad. I can say that that ad uh, is outperforming benchmark data by about three times as well. So that is an actual ad that is running right now, starting with this, 
to this, and to this. And that's just one angle, right? You would want to do that for whatever your, your focus is of the audience that you're looking to call out, right? Um, if that's the community and safety, if is that the K-8 versus K-12 angle, um, whatever it might be, you can try to use. And then again, that's just using this exact framework. Thoughts, questions, concerns? Do we like that framework? I think that'd be helpful. Can I ask a question? Shoot. Uh, wouldn't you agree, um, and, and maybe this is part of a whole um, marketing plan uh, to connect with admissions, is that there should be follow-up when someone that gets through those ads and signs up for a tour, comes for a tour and hears something similar in a uh, in a pitch during the during the tour of the school. Now you're now you're talking like that's <laughs> that's that's it. Uh, what, what was the? I think it was maybe on this first webcast, Tim. We talked a lot about that, which is like getting everybody on board with marketing the school, right? And there was even the suggestion of holding an internal, um, like almost like a, an hour long little PD for you know, teachers and other uh, administrators saying like, here's our messaging. Here's what we're looking to promote. You know, Here's why families are choosing us. The family asks you, hey, well, why choose this school? Everybody might have their own different answers, but you really wanna to try to hone in on that core messaging so that if a parent goes to the head of school, the admissions director, another existing parent, a teacher, they're all pretty much saying the same thing, right? Um, I've definitely seen that fall apart where they're not saying the same thing. I've heard admissions directors be like, yeah, they want to go talk to those teachers, teachers talking about all this other stuff that we don't want them talking about. And, and so that can happen. So the, the, yes, everything from even just automated follow-up messages to those actual conversations that a parent might have with another parent, a parent ambassador, whoever. Yeah, if I may, just remember, good. it's not really a pitch because you're not selling. What you're doing is getting to know each other. What you're trying to do is to, to somehow put it out there so the people who are looking for something different really feel safe in being able to say, you know, I don't think we're a good fit, but I really appreciate the way you handled this interaction. So it's not a hard sell. I'm certainly nothing negative about it any other school. In in our community, we yeah. have lots of great educational choices, right? There's no one school that's perfect for everyone. Let me tell you about what we love about our school and see yeah. if it resonates with you. That's not a pitch exactly. It's uh it's really trying to spotlight, like in an art gallery, put a piece of art on a pedestal or on a wall and you put spotlights on it. You're trying to draw attention to it. It's simply focusing on some aspect of your school that you think is really important. And it may or may not be what that parent is looking for. Yeah, that, again, I'll just use relationship. The... Sorry. No, the, the, that's all right. Uh, I was just going to say, my, again, my example, I think I used in the, the first session was, again, looking at a school you know, for my daughter. And one of the the appealing points to it, I mean, certainly they have what we were looking for, which is like, it was, it was going up to an eighth grade school, you know, allowing kids to be kids like that. Their messaging from their website to the parents, to the teachers, to the admissions director, to head of school, it was all the same, right? So anybody can put something on their website and sometimes you're like, oh, is that just, is that coming from a marketer? Is that just marketing speak? Like I get what we're going for here. But then when everybody says the same thing, right? Yeah, kids are just so happy here. They're allowed to be kids, you know, they're not trying to get into Harvard in first grade, right? So everybody had that same message. And even talking with the head of school, you know, when uh, he was like, look, you know, in our area, all these schools are going to be great academically. Like, you really can't go wrong. But here's, just like the tip said, it was like a great transition. You're going to, there's great schools here. Here's why families come to our school. Here's here's what they're looking for. And everybody said the same thing. So when everybody says the same thing, like, oh, that must, that must be true, right? And so that that's what you're, that's what you're going for. I would suggest that one thing that probably all of our schools have in common is that the parents who choose us and are happy 
they're happy not just because their child's getting a great education and because obviously they hopefully enjoy going to school, they have friends there, but they themselves as parents feel they're getting value out of it. And I think one of the things we want to be looking at, especially in this first step of the dance, which is an ad, any ad is designed to get someone to take an initial step in a dance. So you have to think about it from the point of view, what is the parent's experience going to be? How can you speak to what they're hungering for, which is emotional as much as logical? Yeah. So as we look to the wrap up here, and, and Tim, I apologize. I have to jump on a call at two. So I'll, I'll kind of finish some things on my end. And then if we have to hop off or I'll, I'll uh, hop off. But um, I was just going to share just some templates, some Canva templates, if anybody wants to see those, some images that, that tend to work pretty well. All right, I'll show those real quick. And, and as I show this, again, to reiterate about images, um, like the nice part about Can, you know, if you use Canva or something else, there's beautiful templates in there. Like it looks pretty, it looked really good, really professional. Just use them. The what you'll see in here, there, there's nothing special about the template. Um, but what I would say is across the board, the images that tend to work best have two components. There is some form of text and branding, and two, there's motion to them. And I'll show you, I'll show you what I mean. So let me show you some examples. Right. So even if your your image was just this, and this is just a stock photo, you probably don't want to show kids and be showing from behind, but uh, just put, you know, what's going to get them to stop scrolling? Even if it's just open house, um, you know, here's some really great messaging. You know, it's just some, some of Tim's messaging, which I think is great. I want my child to think outside the box. Montessori is the answer. Put your school name in there. Or, or, uh, Montessori is the answer. Ames Academy is the school. Um, these are just templates, right? So, and actually, I think this is the highest performing template that we have, by the way. Um, which it's it's just a template, right? Um, the other high performing one, by the way, is this one, which I don't even necessarily love it, but it works every single time. It typically outperforms, and I think part of it's just a little paper airplane that's moving. But but here's just a quick tip. So again, you'll have a link to this. Use these. Feel free to use other templates. There's plenty of other ones in there that that are really good. Uh, this one actually does really well. Um, just do this. Come in here, right? Do something like this. Just highlight it all. Go to where is it? Hold on. Where's the animate button? Oh, it's, I already clicked it. That's why it should say animate. So you could do something like this. Just put some motion into it, and um, that always performs better than just a static image. Now, videos typically outperform, but everybody's video, videos can be different, but test them. So my point here is, the reason why I'm not like, you have to use this template is because you never know which one's gonna be the best. Um, try four or five of these and just let them run. You'll find out what works very quickly. Look at click-through rates and things like that. And so at the end of the day, if you follow some of these just basic guidelines, which is, Come up with three or four angles, come up with three or four images or more. And next thing you know, you've got 15 to 20 different ads. And now you're gonna get some really great data to tell you, you know what, when we use the quote about the parent talking about how much their kid loves the school, that ad is great. When we talk about our outdoor classrooms, that's just, it's just not resonating, right? And it's probably because other schools might be talking about their different parts of the curriculum and everybody's got their own bells and whistles with their, with their school, you know, but whether it's messaging, like I think this is really unique messaging, which is, which is great. These, this performs really well. I've seen this headline do really well. You're going to love it here. Very simple, straightforward, but you know, really, really speaks, uh, really hits emotionally. Uh, Cause this is what, at the end of the day, this is what everybody wants. It's just, am I going to love it here? Right. You are going to love it here. Um, Tim, any thoughts about copy creative? One of the things we might want to do is a follow-up where we really try to gather 
maybe with some advanced, let's find the very best ads we've ever seen or done uh, and just kick ideas around because there are many of them. Like I love, come see how good a school can be. Um, you're going to love it here. The school we're thinking goes to school. Um, you know, no, we're not going to prepare your child for Harvard. We're going to help your child find the perfect university uh, for them. You know, there's a million variations on these things and coming up with stuff that to you resonates, that you think will work. You know, we're, it's really, really important. You're spending a lot of time, a lot of energy. And my wife and I always said over the last 50 years, if we spend this money on doing this thing, whether it's a video or a, a brochure or running an ad in the Washington Post, how many kids would it take for it to have been well worthwhile. And these days, the odds are you're probably getting between 10 and $30,000 a year a child. It doesn't take that many kids. If you do one more thing that works, this is the kind of investment that can pay really big dividends. The other thing is to remember if a family, if something you do this in this next six months, causes an extra kid to come to your school and stay for five years, the value of your time, your investment is five or six years worth of that. So it's really important to think about the basic truisms. It's always easier to resell people that are already involved with you. It's really much easier to try to keep people from leaving than it is to get a new person to come in and word of mouth absolutely works great, but it works really against you too if you let people in your school who decide you've let them down because there's nothing more powerful than a parent who says, this school did not meet my child's need, they did me wrong. So what we're trying to do is ask ourselves, what are we really good at? What are our people really good at? Who would love us for what we are? And how can we find more people who are going to really want to be part of it. Regina and I are longtime Montessori people, right? Our, our tendency is to try to convert people. Doesn't usually work. <laughs> what does work is find people who love us and just get into a conversation and see if we can turn them into groupies. It's true of every school. Tim, Tim, you once said that if you had $10 for every family that loves you but have to leave, you wouldn't have to fundraise because they love us but then they want to leave. So I put something in the chat in terms of perhaps it's also a venue for parent education to remind parents why they joined us in the first place. Uh, uh, sometimes when somebody came to my office saying, well, we're thinking of leaving, if at least they came to tell me, um, I would then remind them of, of why they joined and see how we're still offering what we said we would offer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were able to adapt to their ch changing needs and the child's changing needs. So yeah. We've Let seen everything real quick. Let's, Tim, I just have to hop off real stuff. quick. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. See everybody. Hi, Clint. And Clint will send out um, the transcript and the summary and recording as soon as I've got it ready. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And again, we really encourage you to keep joining us. Bring your problems. We're here to help. We're not just here to lecture you. We're here to try to help you both learn things and talk to each other and 